Hello, everyone, and welcome to the BirthFit Podcast. This is episode number 236, and we have two very special guests with us today. Um, my little one is in the background. You might hear some little noises. She is running a fever, so I'm keeping her close to me. But Diane Lee is the guest I've been looking forward to speaking with. Uh, she is a physiotherapist from Canada. She's been doing research and in practice for probably longer than some of you have been alive, and <laughs> which is wild. Like to still love what you do is amazing, Diane. But um, her focus is on pelvic girdle pain, um, diastasis, like DRA, what you might call diastasis rectus abdominis, um, and kind of the whole core and pelvic floor as it relates to pregnancy, postpartum that whole um, motherhood transition. For those of you that don't know, our podcast is a product of our nonprofit. So if you want to check out our nonprofit organization, go to birth nonprofit.birthfit.com. Check it out. And um, we are definitely, you know, gearing up to support one family a month for military. Um, if their husband's active duty military or if they're active duty military and they need birth support or postpartum doula support, by all means, go to that website, donate. If you're active duty military, fill it out, and we'll try to support you in the best way that we can. All right, so let's dive in. I promised uh, Diane I wouldn't read her long bio, but um, she's a legend, and um, I've been following her for a few years now as I started diving into research around DRA, and what sparked me was um, the fact that she's one of the only voices that says the distance between the rectus abdominis doesn't matter, that functionality reigns supreme. And before we dive into that, um, I don't know if, Diane, you want to jump on and give a little background how you got into pregnancy, postpartum, and, you know, what, what lights your fire? And, like, it's really freaking cool that you're still doing it. Oh, thanks. So thanks for having me, Lindsay. Um, boy, that's a, a big loaded question. So first of all, people often think that I'm a researcher and I'm not. I contribute to research with um, advice from the trenches, if you like, or from what we are seeing in, in, in the clinic. Um, I apply the evidence and, um, and inform people uh, and researchers themselves when what they're doing really, really resonates and makes sense. And then sometimes with what they're doing, raises questions and sometimes those questions change practice and sometimes they don't. So my actual involvement in research as a collaborator started in 2007 with a patient who had a DRA, a diastasis, that we couldn't help get better. And she was asking me if surgery would help. And it raised the question of when do we when do we uh, advise somebody to go get their abdominal wall repaired versus when do, when do we keep training? And we don't have the answers for that. Then We didn't have the answers then. We're a little clearer now. But that journey from 2007 to 9 led me to take that question to Professor Paul Hodges, whom you all know from the University of Queensland in Brisbane. And Paul really helped me um, develop a study, a clinical study that led to the publication in 2016 of the paper that Lindsay is talking about, about the interrecti distance, its behavior during a curl up. And one of the things that we discovered when we were training this, these women is that they, all of their functional outcomes were getting better. They were getting stronger, their bellies looked better, they were happy, their incontinence, not all of them, but for a, a lot of them was improving. And yet this interrecti distance was widening. And so we knew we had the wrong question um, in terms of that research at the beginning. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit in more depth. But it's the patients that don't get better from when we think they should that really tweaks my curiosity to learn more about why and how can we help. And every day, no, every week at least in the clinic, there's a clinical puzzle that comes before me that is challenging. And sometimes we can resolve that clinical puzzle. 
And sometimes we can't. And that always either sends me to the books, sends me to the evidence, send me to seek out who, who knows what I don't know and who can, who can help these people. So my drive and passion really comes from the individual that I see in, in the clinic or my team sees in the clinic and come to me, comes to me for help. And uh, helping somebody who's failed to get better with multiple other attempts never gets old. Never gets old. I may get old, but it never gets old. <laughs> That's awesome. So as a manual therapist and phys like physiotherapist, where did you turn to or do you have any mentors that uh -huh. helped you out on your journey? Uh, several, but the one who always comes to mind is Cliff Fowler. So Cliff was in Canada very much like uh, Jeff Maitland. Um, I'm trying to think of some other ones. I, Jeff Maitland comes to mind the most. He's about the same age or was the same age as, as Cliff. They are one of the founding founding fathers of manual therapy in your country and in mine. And I had the opportunity to work for Cliff when I was a very young physio. I think I was 26 years old. And Cliff, I was about to quit. I really didn't see very much value in our profession other than walking people down the hall, fitting crutches, putting a hot pack on their back. And really, there were no exercises at the time that were known to help people with back pain. And uh, Cliff really... Um, taught me how to learn from the patient, taught me how to use my hands and, and yeah, really, really put some structure into what I was doing. And he was a mentor for me his entire life until he died two years ago at the age of 82. I would always go to him for uh, advice on different things. And there were a number of people, but I think Cliff Fowler was probably number one mentor I had. And I think it's really important for people to have mentors in, in their professional life, people who also are on a journey and continuing to learn. And it doesn't mean you have to have the same one your entire career, but to, to have people, particularly in both fields, both the clinical field and in the research field, whose work you follow, because they inspire you to either apply their research into your clinical practice or to just look at things a bit differently. So we challenge our thinking all the time because that's how we grow is by thinking about our thinking and not getting stuck in, in ruts or ever saying that, you know, we know everything because we never do, right? It's, there's always going to be someone that shows up that challenges what you think. And so, yeah, we always have to have peer support, group support and mentor support, I think, our entire career, all our life, I think. That's so refreshing. There she is. <laughs> that's so refreshing to hear from a professional such as you that's been in this forever. Um, that's probably a mentor to many out there. She's voicing her opinion. Yeah. <laughs> um, there we go. So being a manual therapist, being very hands-on, what would you say, like, Every time I see a woman come in or reach out to birth it, hopefully you can hear me okay. I can, I can, yeah. Keep going. We're all used to babies crying. <laughs> <laughs> that it's all very unique and they're, each case is very unique. Would you say that's the case for DRA or core and pelvic floor? Or would you say there's one general theme across the board? Uh, great question. And I think it's... um. I mean, systematic reviews of randomized clinical control trials are really, really important for pharmaceuticals. They're really important for a number of trials, but I'm not so sure how, how valid they are for understanding what we have to deal with as clinicians every day in, day out. Because there isn't um, an RCT that is a perfect match for any patient I've ever met. I don't recognize my patients in the RCT because they have to be blended. They have to be dissected down or minimized to you have, you have a DRA. Okay. So what you have pain here and then they try an intervention and they have to keep it simple to minimize the confounding variables. Well, our patients aren't simple. They have a ton of biomechanical things. They have an ankle problem. They have had a concussion. They have had a back injury, and now they have a baby. Well, what role is their floppy ankle or poor ankle control, or maybe their ACL on their knee from a sports injury in, the, in their 20s or a teenager, 
Or what impact is that dural tension from the concussion having on the coccyx and thus pulling on the pelvic floor? Like none of these variables are considered in, in, in any uh, collectively in any RCT. So we start to see these complex persistent patients being offered um, pain neuroscience, which is not a bad thing, but it's almost like the root cause or the reasons, there's all, always more than one in these complex case, cases, are, are being um, ignored and saying, well, because we can't understand what's going on with you, uh, it's, 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 it's causing a pain song or nociception, therefore we just are going to explain it and um, help you manage it and you get on with it. And that annoys the heck out of me. Um, now, obviously there are some people for which that is true, but there are many, many, many where the nociplasticity is just a part of their whole story. So let's bring this back now to DRA. There are many different subsets of, of DRA in terms of the location. There are ones that are predominantly in the upper abdomen. So these are ones that are kind of like right below, right below the, the ziphoid. So here to here in this area where you see the widening, uh -oh. they're going to impact control of the lower thoracic ribs. We don't call them ribs. Wait, the whole Diane, ribs. I, we lost you for a second. Um, Am I back? Yes, you're back and you stopped on DRA that impacts the upper abs. Okay. So you can have an individual who has had a separation or a stretch. It's not a tear, a stretch of the fascial tissue and rectus sheaths high up in the abdomen. That's going to affect the low thorax. So they're going to have difficulty controlling the low thorax and their upper lumbar spine then those who have more of a stretch around the, the umbilicus or the navel, they're going to have more problems with their back, controlling the segments of their lumbar spine. And the ones that are really low, and I mean not just two centimeters below the umbilicus, I mean between the, the, the anominates, between the iliums of the pelvis, these are not common due to pregnancy. They're common due to cesarean sections where the rectus don't come back together naturally as they think it should. So these are usually C-section induced. They're going to affect your pelvic control. And then you have the individuals who have the separation from top to bottom. So Cordino um, divided or categorized DRA into five different types. The most common type is the one from the navel up to about two or three centimeters above. So it really impacts uh, lumbar spine control, can it impact lumbar spine control. But then on top of not only where the separation is, but how the individual is trying to compensate for that. They, they don't all have back pain. They don't all have incontinence. They don't all have the same, the same presentation of symptoms. And for this reason, any research trial that begins with, we took a group of people with incontinence or back pain and then tried to see if the DRA was a player in that is always going to fail because there, there, it, there isn't commonality amongst the women. And everyone who works with these women will go, yeah, that's exactly what I see. You see some women who are more concerned about the psychosocial factors of their abdominal wall, sexual intimacy. They don't like the look of their skin. Their belly isn't flat anymore. They don't feel, they don't feel sexy. They don't feel like they can be intimate with their partner anymore. And that's as important as somebody who can't lift their child because it's a huge part of life, right? Um, it affects your self-esteem. It affects the clothing that you wear. It affects everything about yourself. And then we have the others for whom the loss of the, when somebody can't compensate for what the abdomen is supposed to do, they, they may end up with back pain during certain tasks. And those tasks, Nicole Hill found in Canada, are almost always related to rotation. So lifting and twisting, putting your child in a car seat, lifting and twisting them out of the bathtub, um, taking your increasingly heavy child and handing them off to a partner and not having just to be a log that turns like this. So women who have 
um, poor function of the abdominal walls, secondary to the laxity in the fascial compartments, often overuse either their back extensors. So they tend to look like a banana back. So they're really extended. Not all of them, but many of those tend to get really compressed in their lumbar spine because of what the erectors do. And they tend to present with more back pain than the group of people who try to use the external oblique or the obliques to, to compensate. And that what the obliques do is they compress the thorax down into the pelvis with an excessive amount of flexion which makes their tummies look worse because it increases the pressure in the abdomen. And if they've had a vaginal delivery, one or two or three, and they have an increase in the size of the levator hiatus, they may be predisposed to incontinence or pelvic organ prolapse because of the pressure that's coming from the secondary strategy they're using to compensate mm. for the loss of the exposure of the abdomen. This, okay, this all is super cool, by the way. Um, <laughs> I want to back up and touch on how you said um, the different classifications. And um, to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like being able to classify the DRA might be super helpful in treatment. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't always happen that way for women, you know. PTs, just PTs, chiropractors, midwives, OBs, whoever, there's like, okay, boom, you got DRA blanket statement. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> so in terms of assessment, yeah. you look at the, number one, you look at the abdominal profile, um, it, just in standing. So what does her tummy, what does mom's tummy look like? Then you ask her to recruit her pelvic floor. Now, what should happen with a good pelvic floor contraction? You should see the low belly lift, the navel draw to spine, and then the upper abdomen may not respond to the pelvic floor. So you can then layer on just like a rib cage hug cue to see if she can draw in the upper abdomen, number one. So you can see what the response of the connective tissue is to a cue that's supposed to recruit transversus in conjunction with the pelvic floor to draw things in, number one. That's one test that's going to tell you where's the abdomen not working well. Second test is your load transfer tests. So you have the person in sitting with their arms out like this. You put a rotation load through because rotation is usually the weakest um, load they can manage. And you're observing, can they keep the thorax still over top of the lumbar spine? Can they keep the lumbar spine still over the pelvis? So often what's ha what happens when you rotate them, number one, they can't lock in. So they can't resist you. You can break them really easily. And then you see, you see things like, let me adjust my camera here a bit. You'll, you'll see that their thorax shifts like this. So they're doing this and this. Or even more subtly, if you palpate the lumbar spine at the back, you'll feel the, the, the middle of their back is rotating. So that's your second clue. So in standing, if you see they can't draw in the upper abdomen, and with the low transfer test, they can't control the upper abdomen, go assess the abdomen, upper abdomen. If it's the navel, they can't draw to spine, and they can't control L3 or L4, the middle of their back is moving all over the place, go assess the middle of the linea or around the umbilicus. And then there's pelvic control tests and, and so on and so on. If that's a problem, go assess the lower fibers. But we'll stay with the common ones. 59% are at the umbilicus and above. So almost 60% yeah. are there. Let me finish. So then, then you go and assess what is the tension like in the linea alba from the ziphoid down, where is it the most lax? Where can you distort it the most? And then we test the abdominal muscles. You give them a response to a cue which should activate TA, and they should be able to generate tension in the linea alba. And if that tension reduces the depth of the that you can push it in, that is a good prognostic indicator that you can help that woman get better. That's okay. huge. That I mean, I wish 
Not about the width. It will get wider. There are so many studies from Carrie Bowe's group now in Scandinavia and in, from Brazil and Portugal and Spain and our study. We all showed the same thing. It's got to be a truth. Yeah. As versus contracts, it widens the interrecti distance. And it's the interpretation of that finding that we disagree with. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say because I've heard, you know, PTs in America say, contract your TA and it'll bring it back together. It's like, no. no. No, it does not. No study. That's what I mean about being in the trenches. And you think you think it's closed because you can't feel the distance. You can't feel the edges of the rectus anymore. So the assumption is it must have come together. No, it's pulled apart. And you can't feel the edges anymore. And the people who say this are not working with ultrasound imaging. So when you work with ultrasound, you can totally see that this lax little bit of tissue called the linea alba, when they connect laterally to the TA, it pulls the recti apart. And so everybody thinks, oh, this is a bad thing. It's making the DRA worse. No, it's increasing the interrecti distance and therefore generating tension around the whole, the whole fascial system so that loads can be transferred. So if you think of it like a, a suspension bridge, the, the lower the bridge hangs across the river or the canyon, the more wobbly it is, right? The more wobbly it is. But if something was to pull those edges of the, of the bridge tight, really tight, and now the cable systems are really tight, that bridge would be, you could transfer tons of stuff across it without it being wiggly and wobbly. That makes, if you know great. anything about Andre Fleming's work, this fits beautifully into the force closure mechanisms for joint control. So the stiffer the fascial system, the less muscular effort is required to transfer forces. So it's about efficiency of movement. And this is where also the capacity or size of your rectus abdominis is important as well. Because remember, it's not just the linea alba that gets stretched in a DRA. The rectus abdominis gets stretched. And we also have some studies now that have shown one study from Sweden that is starting to look at the linea semilunaris, which is the attachment point of the lateral abdominals to the lateral aspect of the rectus. So how much of the connective tissue all the way around the, the trunk is really getting stretched? No one's looked at the lateral raffae at the back where the abdominals attach to rectus spining. All the focus has been on the front. But pressure is disseminated everywhere in the trunk during pregnancy. So it won't surprise me if we start to find some people where there's laxity right from the spinous process at the back all the way around to the front. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. So as we build up capacity or size inside the muscles inside those fascial canisters, we will be taking up some of the slack. Because in my opinion, and it's only clinical opinion at this time, we don't have enough studies to, to say that this is truth. But we've done a prospective trial looking over three years, looking at training women hard, really training their abdomens hard. And what we found is that after a period of natural healing, which seems to not be a point in time, but a, a region in time, and it's between 14 to 16 months postpartum. After that time, it doesn't matter what you do, there's no change in the resting interrecti distance. It stays the same. Wow. Now we can change distortion. Huh. We can change its behavior. We right. can strengthen up the abdominal wall, and in many of those women, we can make we can make have them become strong and fit. And Anthony Lowe is all over this, right? I mean, it's totally Anthony's story. These women don't break. You can train them very, very hard, and you won't make it worse either. Right. But if you were to measure that interrecti distance five years later, and we had one woman in the trial who was thirty years later. Whoa. Interrecti distance is still the same. No change. No change. So the the sweet spot or the the region you said was 12 to 18 months? Yeah, it's it's up to about 16, 14, 16 months. Okay. 
That makes me question, Lindsay, all of the trials that are done in the first six months that have shown that this or that improved the DRA and the outcome being that the interrectal distance got smaller. How do you know that that intervention had any effect at all and that it wasn't just time? Because even the control groups who are age and time matched have the same thing, changes that are happening. So you'd think that it, you'd be able to, with, a, with controls in the studies, know that, note that there's a difference. And so the, the results from the, the IRD, using the IRD as a valid measure, well, number one, the indirect distance has never been shown to have validity or to mean anything for either classification, severity of function or dysfunction, or as an outcome measure for progress with any treatment intervention. Right, there's it's nothing still being used. It's still being used, right? Yeah, it's like the only thing that's being used, uh -huh. you know, and I say just uh -huh. generally across the board, it's like, okay, two fingers, two finger breaths, you know, and that's two finger breaths. Well, what's that, you know? And then totally. like you said the validity of it just is bogus. It's not there. It's not there. So when I took, so all through the pandemic, I started off with a group of um, nine, 13 women and then recruitment stopped because of the pandemic. And four women dropped out of the trial because it was hard to continue to, to train and to do the things we asked them to do. So we ended up with, with nine women in, in this prospective training trial. And they all had an IRD greater than four centimeters. So these weren't small ones that tend oh, to do well yeah. no matter what you do, right? Just just go to the yoga studio, go to Pilates, go to training, just do something, it'll get better. These are the big ones. These are the ones that are often accompanied with a symptom or a functional impairment of some sort. So the largest, the largest one we had was over eight centimeters and she was a, a fairly large woman. So eight centimeters on her frame was not as big a deal as the seven and a half centimeters on Abigail, who was like a size two. She was wow. a very small gal and had a huge separation. Mm -hmm. And she she was our rock star in this study. She trained, she trained hard and consistently doing what we asked her to do. And she was able to completely eliminate the alien, the dome that sticks out when you, she was completely yeah. able to eliminate it and to get strong, but she wasn't able to generate tension in that and start even start to get it strong till almost two years into the program, right? Wow, okay. Two years into the program. And the her interrecti distance went from 7.74 down to 5.8. And she started four months postpartum. Okay. And that decrease of nine centimeters, if I remember right, happened in that first year of oh. training. But I don't think it had anything to do with the training. I think it was just natural, the, the loss of the pressure inside, the loss of the sustained stretch. That's just what happened to her connective tissue over time. Because that resting interrecti distance from 14 months postpartum did not change oh. until three years later, stayed the same. That, and so when I took all this data, I measured these women every three months they came into the clinic and we did ultrasound images at all three points, no, two points, just above the umbilicus and halfway between there and the xiphoid, every three months at rest, during an automatic curl up and during a curl up where they recruited their TA um, for as long as they were in the trial. And I just felt I had chaos. The interrecti distance sometimes was wider at rest than narrower at rest. It changed all over the place. Mm. And what I realized watching it is that the interrecti distance is a function of what your transversus is doing. And what transversus is doing is a function of your gut health, irritability in, 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 the, in your visceral system, right? Mm. Um, if you're sensitive to gluten or you have some irritable bowel, that can change the recruitment, the recruitment strategy. And so it's not as finite and as structural or as linear a measure as we think when we only measure it at two time points in a study. Even four time points in a study 
it's getting better, but it's not enough. It's, yeah. it's you know, it's not like four times, it's not 12 time points over three years. And I just thought I had chaos when mm -hmm. I went to Australia with all this data, I dumped it on Paul's lap because I don't know how to figure out the distortion index. And that's one of the cool things about being a clinician collecting data, but doesn't understand what they've got. And then having a, a researcher, someone like Paul, that just looks at all the images and applies the, the software, imaging software and everything else to <laughs> figure out the distortion index. And I could tell him that for a lot of these women, they were now able to generate tension. They were stronger. They still struggled with rotation. In some, a lot of their symptoms had changed. They weren't completely alleviated, but they were improved. Um, but other than that, I didn't know what I had. Yeah. Every single one of those um, nine women, the distortion index decreased dramatically. Wow. So what that means for us as clinicians is that we have to stop worrying about how wide this thing is and really start to pay attention to how deep is it? How far can I push this in? Mm -hmm. So you're going to start measuring the depth of your finger. And so how hard do you push it in before you take that measure? So in physiotherapy, we talk about Maitland's concept of R1, the first resistance. So that's what we've been using. We push the tissue in until we feel we start to get the first resistance back. Because of course, you can always push it further and then yeah. the that come together with that push, right? You can distort everything and push it in. And some of these women, you could feel the aorta. You could go right back to the spot, yeah. push it all the way in. That's not, we're not about taking the whole of the abdomen and inverting it. It's just when you push it in a little bit, when you get to R1, then you measure on your finger, how far is that? And I think we could, if we did an intertestor reliability study, we're not going to go, oh, it's to my first digit or second digit because our digits are different length. Yeah. We have to measure that then and say, yeah. well, how many centimeters deep is this, right? Right. It's the depth. And that's what changes over time. And if you can distort the tissue less, so let's say then they recruit the deep system, mm -hmm. the pelvic floor TA, and now do a short head and neck curl up. So now we've brought on EO, IO, left and right, left and right rectus, left and right TA, pelvic floor, hopefully without too much chest gripping. So you've got a co-activation strategy of all the abdominals because they're yeah. all important. Then they lift their shoulders up and then you see what happens to the linea, what happens to the linea alba. Any resting distortion should get less, okay? Oh. Now, yeah. that's the assessment test. It's not how we train women. It's right. really hard to do a sit-up, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, there's so many different ways or compensation patterns. Yes, yes. People arch their back. They use their psoas, TFL, rec fem. They do anything to try and use yeah. momentum. No. We use a we, – we, the, the exercise we ask these women to do – is a if for those of you that have done Pilates, it is a seated hundreds curl. Hmm. So in the seated sitting position, sitting on a neutral pelvis, so not in a posterior tilt, not in an anterior tilt, but in a neutral pelvis, you begin by recruiting the deep system. So that may be a pelvic floor cue, or it may be an abdominal cue, abdominal hollowing, whatever whatever it is that the person uses to to wake up the deep system. Then keeping their shoulders still, they start with a reverse curl, posterior pelvic tilt. So they start from here, reverse curl. That brings on the rectus, okay, with no chest gripping. So just the reverse curl. Then they hold this and then start to open the hip angle, lean back. None of this, no chest, no, no belly popping, no, no chest, no back arching. So they have to keep, no arching. yeah, they got to keep the curl position and they start to lean back mm -hmm. and they lean, how far back do they lean? They lean back as far as they can control it where you start to shake because all the good stuff for both fascial loading and for strengthening happen in the moments of that shake like when it's really hard. And we ask them to do the number of these curls to that shake point until they couldn't do any more, which was about five to seven minutes, right? Five to seven oh. minutes of that, three times a week. 
So we were asking of them 10 minutes of your time, three days a week. That's it. So it wasn't a big ask. And you could do anything else you wanted. Go to Pilates, go to yoga, do, do whatever you wanted. We just wanted you to add, add this exercise in, into your daily routine. That's, that's what the trial was really all about. And our assumption was that if we could load this connective tissue, just like we load an Achilles tendon or the glute, the glute tendons, that the, the fascia, the connective tissue would restructure itself and that maybe the blueprint of the body would have the, the would, would close that IRD. And right. it, didn't. it didn't. Wow. Loading the fascia didn't change it, didn't change the structure of it. It certainly changed the capacity of the muscles. And that would allow the, the, the muscular system to take up more tension mm. in the fascia they had. But my current belief, and it still is an opinion and it's not evidence or known, is that after a period of time, that RID is not going to change. And that may be depressing news for a lot of people, but it's a reality. Yeah. It doesn't change, right? right? It doesn't change with exercise. So stop guilting yourself that you're not training hard enough or exercising hard enough and stop blaming yourself. Right. That but this thing is as wide as it is. I don't think you're going to change it after a period of time, but that doesn't mean you can't get stronger, that you can't change the profile of your abdomen that, um, and even if you have a really wide IRD, if you're able to do all the things that you want to do and have no or minimal symptoms, life is not about having no symptoms, but having manageable symptoms that don't impact what it is that you want to do. Right. Put your kids and the gift of your kids and what you've got. And yeah, the consequence may have been your tummy a little bit, but yeah, it's like the functionality ideally is what reigns supreme. Um, that's a good point to ask this question. And you brought this up earlier, which I'm holding my fingers because I got different questions, but, um, Somebody was asking about when do you suggest surgery for either DRA or even organ prolapse? Um, but like you just said, if it's reality, you know, if we, if you could be honest with um, your clients and say, you know, hey, 12 to 16 months is this kind of the sweet spot, the range. After that, you know, it doesn't look hopeful for bringing IRD together or approximating it. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on surgical intervention? So if I'm working with a postpartum mom or any of my team is working with a postpartum mom, and they usually <clears throat> they usually come back about between six and eight weeks for their postpartum check, and we notice then that if they've got like a five-finger separation, five to eight-finger separation, we know we're going to be following this woman for probably two years before we make that decision, Okay. Got it. Okay. If you're looking at somebody who has within six to eight weeks, a three, three finger separation, she's going to do just fine. She's going to do just fine. Um, so sometimes that width of it, right, postpartum, and there's no evidence that supports that. But obviously, the bigger they are, the more distorted they are. Not true. The, if you have a, a wide IRD, but it's not that deep, they're going to do okay. If you have a narrow, a narrower one, say four fingers, but man, I can't even find R1. I can sink all the way down to the spine. That's more of a concern to me. So it's more about the distortion that I'm interested in for, pro for prognosis. Um, and so I set the timeline. We set the timeline right for the beginning of expectation. We are going to be measuring depth, not width. The width will do what it will do. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to um, flatten, flatten your tummy and stop being asked if, you know, oh, you're expecting a gain already, you know, that pregnancy question that yeah. everybody hates. All right. So you, let's say that you, you have been training fairly well in that first year postpartum, and we've gone a few months beyond the 14 months. So we're looking at 16, 18 months now, and the person is still unsatisfied Right. With what? This is a biopsychosocial condition. Okay. So the dissatisfaction 
may not be biomechanical. They may be able to do all the things they want to do, but they've got a really wrinkly looking damaged skin, damaged tummy, mm -hmm. and this, and it doesn't, it's not as flat as they want it to be. Um, and they, if they don't always think about recruiting their TA, the dome comes out, the alien comes out, they yeah. can't wear a bikini anymore. And it's really starting to impact their, maybe not the relationship with their partner, but maybe their relationship with themselves. Yeah. And they decide that they want surgery. That should not be judged. If someone has good function, mm -hmm. but their psychology is, is such that they don't feel good about themselves, that is a good enough reason for me to support mm -hmm. that surgery. Because mental health is as important as physical health. It's going to affect everything she does as a mother. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Obviously, the, the biomechanical one is the one that, you know, we, we all go after as, as mm -hmm. mechanics. You know, if you can't control the joints of your spine or your pelvis or your thorax, and you want to do tasks, you want to do something more than walking or cycling or a rowing machine. Because these are all things that, that the rectus can manage and handle. But when you can't cross forces across the midline, then tasks like paddling or tennis or pickleball or golf or uh, dancing with lots of rotation, these sorts of things, or simply lifting and twisting with your kids, that be can become potentially um, hurtful for your spine. Okay, so I'm not saying this is going to be hard for everybody and I don't want to create, you know, catastrophic thinking. Yeah. But for people who have had dodgy backs going into their pregnancy, this adds more of a load onto their lumbar spine. Mm -hmm. and so those are the parameters that we use now. So they've got what we call failure to transfer loads well under loading for rotation, either thorax for the upper DRA, lumbar spine for the middle ones pelvic control for the lower ones, or a combination of all three. They can't control loads. They have trained for a long enough period of time, and you can see on ultrasound that they're recruiting the deep system well. They've built up capacity in the rectus, and still it's not possible for the impact of this training to change the fascial tension enough so that they can transfer loads. And then if I squeeze the tummy together at the front, if I simulate what the surgery is going to do. So it's not about approximating. It's not about that this needs to close. It's that closure reduces the amount of fascial tissue that has to be rendered taut before loads can be transferred. That's what this does. So if we approximate the tissue together and then repeat this test, and they are suddenly really strong, they feel really good, then you know you can predict they're going to have a good outcome. Like oh, good. oh, good surgical outcome. That makes good sense. Surgical outcome. Yeah. Because the surgery doesn't take up any slack out here. It doesn't approximate right. this part. It doesn't do anything at the back. It doesn't change the size of your rectus. Right. It only draws the rectus together. And heaven forbid, there's been a couple, one paper, two papers published that has talked about overlapping the rectus. Don't do that. <laughs> when they do this too tight or they pull it like they do this, I've seen two people that have had that done. And it wasn't a full overlap. It was a partial overlap of the rectus. They can't breathe. They just put a tourniquet on their chest and they just oh. desperately want to get a deep breath and they can't they want to unzip the surgery both of them did and of two only two people but it was it was horrific that sounds terrible so yeah. if they're doing let's say they're they're a good candidate for surgery they've had one kid or one toddler twins they might want another kid would you say wait till you're done having kids yes yeah absolutely most plastic surgeons will want that to happen um, however, if they have the surgery and then unexpectedly get pregnant afterwards, oh. yeah, it's, um, um, I've, I've only followed one person through pregnancy after surgery and if they, they use non-absorbable sutures, right? Non-absorbable sutures and they don't, do, they do, um, individual stitches 
and not a, a sewing thread stitch. Now, the, as I'm saying this, all the stuff's coming into my head. They're doing single threaded stitching now because they've developed some stitching material that has barbs in it where it can't come out backwards. So mm. if it undoes at the top, it won't completely unravel like your jeans do when one part of it lets go, the whole thing goes. Yeah. So they've got some different stitching techniques. So if they've done a good job with this, it, um, it should hold through the pregnancy. The difficulty comes in the last trimester um, and with some, um, with, the, with the abdomen unable to, to lengthen as much as it needs to, if you have a woman who is fairly short-waisted and they tend to really protrude this way, that's going to be more problematic for the, than for the taller woman who right. has more vertical space in, in her abdomen and tends to protrude less. So the issue comes with you know, difficulty breathing, uh, more, more pressure inside. And, and according to some studies I've read, the risk for pregnancy after abdominal repair is an early, early delivery, right? But never, never a premature delivery, always like at 36, 37 weeks instead of full term. Right. They may they may take they may take it really early just because the mom's in a lot of discomfort because they yeah. have to be can. But the, the one person that I followed had a normal vaginal delivery and we followed the linea alba and the linea um, semi linearis here. And she stretched um, between the two sides. She had a, a four centimeter stretch so two centimeters on either side that's where she that's where she stretched but within six weeks postpartum it had come back together so why didn't her linea alba come back together in the first pregnancies that's the piece that we just don't know why why does this happen you can see women with triplets whose bellies look normal and then you see women who have a, a six pound baby and they look like a train wreck like, what is it? And all of the stud that, well, the three studies, I think that um, Pascal and there's another um, person, I'm her name, Moda, Patricia Moda, and part of her PhD studies with um, Carrie Bow looked at the risk factors for developing um, a DRA. They measured abdominal circumference. They measured hypermobility. They measured... Um, what else did they measure? Hypermobility, abdominal, body, body weight, BMI, and how much weight gain. Uh, they looked at all of the mechanical factors that are currently our cognitive belief as to why you get a DRA. None of them were shown to be statistically relevant as to who, who gets a DRA or not. So mechanical factors don't seem to be the risk factors. So on all these websites that say, do my program when you're pregnant and you will avoid a DRA. They're not evidence informed because the evidence informed answer is we don't know. So there looks like there's a difference in, genetically in types of collagen in, in abundances of type one, two and three collagen that may put women at risk. Well, we can't change our genes. Yeah. It's not like picking Levi over, I don't know, some boutique brand jeans. We have what we have, right? And so there's a lot of there's a lot of guilt and shame around this condition that I think we can use the evidence to hopefully lay that at rest, except we're battling a lot of these um, websites that that say the opposite, right? So no. number one, we don't know what causes it. We do know that it seems to relate to pressure over time. So it's it's not about um, any exercise that causes it. It's the time factor and sustained pressure and the ability of your connective tissue to uh, resist change over pressure and time because of pressure and time. And there's no exercise that we could do on the planet that mimics nine months of pregnancy. <laughs> no, heck no. Yeah. Uh, okay, I have one question about um, prolapse and specifically, um, well, first, what are your thoughts on pessaries or um, 
devices like that? I think they're like an ankle brace. Okay. I think I think that if depending on the the type of prolapse you have, so is it a urethra seal or a cystal seal? Uh, well, this woman says she has a grade three bladder prolapse. Yeah, so that would be the cystal seal. And if if the suspensory ligaments of the uh, of the vagina, so the uterosacral and cardinal ligaments, if they're intact and her cervix cervix vault is is um, nicely suspended, then a pessary will work really well. And um, it's it's and how how you can start to tell is if she wears a tampon. If a tampon helps, then a pessary will be even better. So these seals are vaginal wall defects, right? So the, the seals are the cystocele, rectocele, urethroceal. They're all problems with the vagina. And so what a, what a pessary does is it supports the walls of the vagina so that the bladder can't indent into it and move down. The urethra can't indent into it. The rectum can't go into it. But if the, if the vault, if the uterus isn't supported well and the, the, the cervix isn't supported well by its suspensory ligaments, then there's nothing holding the vagina up. And then so in the, in the uterine prolapses, it just pushes it, it pushes it out, right? But it's always worth a try. It's yeah. worth a try, particularly, and, and it doesn't have to be something that's worn 24 seven. It can be you and ins you insert it when you wanna do those tasks that tend to give you the perineal pressure. So if you're gonna go play a game of squash or you're gonna go skiing or golf or go for a big walk, that kind of thing. And you notice after your walk or even after grocery shopping, lifting your kids and a whole bunch of, of bags that if you're feeling the, the perineal pressure, then you can use the pessary like you would put on an ankle brace if you'd had a significant ankle sprain, it didn't fully recover, right? It's a brace. It's a vaginal brace. And uh, I think they definitely think they have, they have a place. Awesome. And then on that same kind of topic, what are your thoughts on um, like menstrual cups or menstrual disc? I don't know if you have any thoughts of how they influence the pelvic floor or DRA or. No idea. <laughs> no idea. Not in my scope of practice. Not, I, I haven't, I haven't no experience with that at all, but I will say that about prolapse, there's yeah. two things we have to think about with prolapse. Number one, like a DRA, has there been structural change in the connective tissue of either mus neuromuscular, neuromyofascial tissue? So in, in the walls of the vagina, in the, in the connective tissue that supports all our pelvic organs in place, has there been a structural change in the size of the levator hiatus? Mm -hmm. Okay, number one. Number two, how well does mom manage pressure? So what's happening with the diaphragm and the low thorax? Are they using a real pressurizing strategy yeah. to transfer loads? So pressure is a one of the tools or one of the ways that we transfer load. So pressurizing the canister sort of allows us to transfer loads. But if the pelvic floor and the, and the pelvic organs can't manage, can't handle that pressure, then we have to look at changing pressure. So how do we change pressure? We change breathing strategies under loading. So instead of exerting on the exhale breath, exert on the inhale. So when you in, take a big inhale breath in, widen the rib cage, keep the central tendon of the diaphragm high, and you'll feel everything lift up. So using almost like what they teach in hypopressives, not mm -hmm. an apneic breath, like I'm not talking about breathe everything out and then use your diaphragm. That's something different, but minimize the descent of the central tendon of the diaphragm. So holding the central tendon of the diaphragm higher in the thorax, breathing in lateral costally will create a negative, a, a lessening of the intra-abdominal pressure. So you don't have as much load that the pelvic floor has to manage. So that's a strategy that, that I use personally a lot of time when I'm swinging kettlebells or doing yeah. heavy weight heavy weight lifting because at my age in my late 60s weight lifting and loading is really important for maintaining mm -hmm. muscle mass balance all of this but I've had um, a problem with inc incontinence and prolapse since the age of 16 when I did a back handspring on the balance beam and landed straddle oh and I really hurt my pelvic floor but I had no treatment yeah I had 
one child at 29, one child at 33. And after my second child, I couldn't walk faster than 3.3 miles an hour on a treadmill without soaking myself. Oh. So I had a birch suspension surgery at the age of 42, which worked really well for about five years. And then the incontinence started coming back. Uh, my story is quite complex. <laughs> Fast forward to where I'm at now, I have that I, I don't have my uterus anymore. But I don't, I, I have a vaginal vault prolapse, a rectocele and a cystocele. So I have all three of them. Right. So if I use a pressure strategy to transfer load, like everything just almost drops below my ischial tuberosities. I just can't, right? Yeah. Yeah. Farting and peeing and just a mess. But I can still, I can still one handedly swing a 25 pound kettlebell really hard. As long as I reverse the breathing pattern, it's an inhale breath. That's wild. Okay. Loading, yeah. Right. And everything, when I do it on the inhale breath, it, it's even though transversus is now working eccentrically. Yeah. Right. Not concentrically. Yeah. It's minimizing pressure. So I still have fascial tension, but I don't have as much intra-abdominal pressure. So playing with the pressure with prolapse I think is huge. That's yeah, that's well brilliant. That's why you do what you do. Um, it's like, try, try playing with breath before yeah. surgery, before resulting to, you know, anything totally. else. Totally. totally. totally, Love it. Yeah. Cause you know, the evidence from the surgery for prolapse, I mean, I'm, I'm a perfect example of that. The surgery tends to last five years and then things come back. Got and it. that tells me that, how we got the problem in the first place hasn't gone away. So yeah, the, the strategies that we've been using are still there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The root, the root issue is still there. It's, oh, okay. Um, well, this has been amazing. I, there was one other question or topic I wanted to touch on and it's the CrossFitters CrossFit world. Um, Cause we get a bunch of them and you know, one of the things, and you might have some thoughts or reflections on this, but um you know, we see women in the CrossFit world getting pregnant now, and then um, especially ones that have been in the CrossFit field a long time. But you touched on something earlier about DRA, where it's like the, um, yeah, bringing, the yeah, bringing the rib cage down. And, you know, some of these women that I've seen where their IRD doesn't change after baby, it's still there, go on to have lower back problems like disc issues yes. or something comes up and we see it a lot in the, before I started working with, you know, only females, the males in the CrossFit world, and we would call it like the extension compression strategy on the back. And I don't know if you have thoughts or, you know, reflections that you want to share about just this specific population. Um, any, anything come to mind? <laughs> yeah. So one of my senior pelvic health therapists right now is a CrossFitter. And she's also pregnant. Um, uh, and Don't mean to throw her under the bus. <laughs> exactly. It's her first baby, though. And, uh, and she's very short-waisted, and she's showing really early. Um, but I think she's going to do, do okay for a couple of reasons. One of the things that people in CrossFit, not all of them, at least the ones we see in the clinic, don't do is the sport itself is highly compressive, right? Highly compressive. And if they don't, compared to yoga and Pilates, where is a lot of lengthening, a lot of lengthening, uh, length and strength. CrossFit has a lot of compression. So if you use one part of your trunk more than another, so the example that you use is the back extension strategy, the risk is an increase in, in thoracic pain or low back pain, right? With that compression strategy. If you use your abdominals excessively, the risk is compression of the rib cage anteriorly. So all of the rings, if you think of the, 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 the rings in your rib cage being like a slinky where it should lengthen and it needs that separation to rotate, oh, this good. rib cage gets incredibly compressed. And that compression stops the rib cage from being able to rotate well. So they're like hulks, you know, they don't rotate well. And so then they start getting more neck pain and low back pain because all the, yeah, the force goes into their neck and their back. And if I had one piece of advice for 
um, people doing CrossFit is to get that chin up bar at the end of your workout and just hang on it for two or a minute, right? Open the system back up again. Do a few downward facing dogs. Get the length back again. And how you know you've got the length back is when you can really get your full rotation back. Don't leave the gym feeling stiff in rotation. Get your thorax mobile again. It's great to get strong and to use the front as much as the back so you right. don't get too much into a back gripping strategy. Don't get too much in a front gripping strategy. Use the back and the front symmetrically and lengthen out afterwards. Mm -hmm. Lengthen out. Love it. Okay. All right. So first of all, thank you so much. You're welcome. Second, where can people find you? And I know you have courses maybe they want to dive into. Yeah. So my education platform is Learn with Diane Lee. If you just Google my name, the two will come up. The clinic yeah. is Diane Lee Physio. The education platform is Learn with Diane Lee. There's several lectures on there. Um, the free lecture, free resources, the the, the courses, there's not many in Australia. I'm finishing up the, the ISM series in Australia um, next week, actually. I fly to Australia. Um, but, and I'm not sure when I'll, when I'll be back there, to be honest. Um, but you'll find the, the agenda of where I'm teaching. I'm slowing down a bit. I hit 70 this year. So it's, uh, I'll still be doing it. I'm not you look sure. fabulous, by yeah, the way. Thank you. Um, I, I, I feel, I feel, 50. I don't feel yeah. right. Uh, but, and I think part of it is that there's still so much to do, right? There's still so much yeah. left to do. Both, got a great mindset for both sure. Personally, personally and, and professionally. But uh, anyway, yeah, learn with Diane Lee. You can find a lot more there and uh, stay curious. Don't worry. You won't break these women and um, work with them hard and don't focus on the IRD. Go for the depth. Go for the depth. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much, Diane. You're Safe travels. Welcome. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Lindsay. Take All care. Right. I hope the little one gets better soon. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. All right, y'all. That was pretty amazing. Um, be sure to go to her website. You can definitely find lots of free stuff on there to um, check out, to learn for yourself, dive deeper. Uh, she's definitely somebody we recommend inside of our birth it coach course to check out and learn from. Um, you know, I feel fortunate enough to have stumbled upon her research and it just made so much sense to me. So go to learnwithdianelee.com and just start digging in. Stay curious, as she says. Thanks so much for hanging out with me today. And I really hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have any questions, by all means, shoot us an email, info at birthfit.com or for Diane, shoot her an email. And um, don't forget to check out our nonprofit, nonprofit.birthfit.com. Any little bit helps there. Much appreciated. Y'all have a wonderful day. All right. Bye.